Well, welcome to the review of modules 2, 3, 4, 5, parts 3 and 4, or bricks 3 and 4. It's, again, it's a review of what we did the second half of the program. And it's interesting that uh, last week we all handed, I handed out copies of these, which hopefully if you're here have one. If not, maybe I can get the young lady in the other room to make me a couple copies so you have one. But in this program, if I have your email, if you didn't put it on the list, make sure I have your email before you leave, uh, if it's not on the list, um, to send you the documents uh, that we have. And when the program is over, I'm going to send a bulk file to everyone that has all the forms, everything from the get-go. Uh, because I'm changing them a little bit here and there as we go through, and I realize, you know, I shouldn't spell that road that way, you know, it's spelled wrong. No, it's just, I have some typos in there that I've had to fix, and some other things, and I've realized that my message wasn't maybe captured the way I thought with the way I presented it, so I had made some tweaks along, along the way. But this is the review of part three and four of our four cornerstones of the lifestyle program. This was our schedule that we had for this class. Today, 11-6, review three and four, last class two weeks on the 20th is going to be the best part of the whole program. A, because you're not going to see me after that, because we'll be done. And B, it gives you a, a what to do next scenario. What do we do? You know, when you've got all this education, you know, okay, I want to build this healthy lifestyle. How do I stick with it? How do I keep it? Well, I want you to join, think about joining my lifestyle program, which is just continuous from now until eternity or until they bury me, which hopefully is a long time from now, that will give you support and direction and additional information along the way so you can keep on track. You'll have somebody to throw f questions to, feedback back, and we'll discuss that when we get to that program in a couple weeks. But So that's really the end. So we went through, oh, it's not there yet, we'll get to it. So this is module, the first part, the first cornerstone was the foundation. Then we went into fitness first. So the second part of this program, the third and fourth brick, are right here. So fitness first. We talked about one and two. The first half was what your fitness plan should consist of and matching needs to goals to a solution. That was the basis of the program. Now we're at, when we did the second part, where and how do you start an exercise fitness program and what else do I need to know and who can help me? So those are the next two important parts of the fitness first, and that's what we're going to review today. We're going to review them with the brick solutions that we have here, the exercise matrix, and talk about some cardio respiratory training. Then we'll get on to nutrition, stress management. So fitness first. First part of the program, I think it is the most important part of developing a health-based, good lifestyle, is getting yourself in a good fitness program. And the first part of it was the walking program, which we talked about in the first part. And the second part now is developing a muscular strength and endurance training program. So what is that? It's different for everybody. Everybody has different uh, needs. That's why when we went through the assessment part of it, where you figure out what you need personally, it's different than anybody else. You need to have an assessment, have somebody go over what your capabilities are, figure out what you can do to improve your lifestyle and your fitness. So the problem is, where and how do I start my wellness program or my fitness and strength program? Well, the solution is the exercise matrix, which we talked about, I'm gonna show you it again, and using that to build functional exercises into your program. So here is the matrix, this is it. This is what I developed because it makes sense to me and it just fell with the name of my company, Prime Fit. So it's push-pull exercises, rotational exercises, intervals, cardiovascular training, locomotion or exercises that help you move, walk, run, crawl, and elevation changes. Those are the exercises that help you get up and down from the ground, up and down from your chair, change your elevation. So those are the basic uh, functional movement patterns that we have. So you can go from just say, hey, this is an exercise matrix, I named it functional matrix because they're all functional exercises. I want to offer people suggestions and ideas so that they can build their functional fitness. So how do you do that? My exercise functional and fit is frequency, intensity, 
type and time. That is the fit. Any exercise, say we use a push-up. Here's our first example. Our push-pull exercise is doing a push-up, 10 to 12 repetitions, just your body weight, two to three days a week. It's pretty simple, all in one place. The rotations are seated floor twist touches. If you're doing that kind of exercise to work your core muscles, just 20, 25 repetitions, just your body weight, two to three days a week. Mini jumping jacks, just mini jumping jacks, not even coming off the floor, just moving all your muscles in, in a continuous, it's going to tax your heart and lungs, it's going to get you some cardiovascular conditioning. But it's a simple exercise. Locomotion walking lunges. So that involves more than just doing, when you're taking a lunge, you're working more of your leg muscles. You're working the muscles you need to locomote, to move. And then elevation changes. Doing a body weight squat, up and down. Your legs are the most functionally important or muscles we have in our body. Because if you can't use your legs, you're in a chair. You're in a chair, all your options are diminished tremendously. So you got to have the ability to strengthen your legs, hopefully to keep locomoting around. So that's a simple functional exercise matrix. That's number one. I've got 150 of these. Or it seems that way. All different exercise programs where all you can use these as say, hey, this is this week I'm using functional matrix B1. I'm going to do these exercises, push-ups, seated foot twist, two to three days a week. That's my week's workout. Simple. It's on one matrix, just on one piece of paper. You don't need to have any anything else. I'm sorry. Yes. Could I, could I just see a squat? I actually was thinking about doing one today and then it was like well do I want to open my open do I want to open how far down do I, I want I'll to give open? you a quick explanation this is Tim's importance on a squat body weight squat Okay, we're not carrying weights. We're not putting barbells on our shoulders. We're getting ourselves because in normal life we're just moving our body around right so we need to be functional with our just our body weight as we get old, certain muscles and joints change and they get sore and you get arthritis, so it makes it harder to do the proper body weight squat. But just think about when you get up from a chair. What muscles are you using when you get up from the chair? You're using a whole bunch. You're using a whole bunch of muscles. So a basic body weight squat, the way I teach it and the way I do it in my classes, hundreds and hundreds of them all the time, is hands start at your side. In other words, what you see a lot of people do is they lean forward and their knees shoot out over their toes. Not good. That's how you get hurt. Your hips sit back. My knees stay over my heels all the time. If I sit back, my knees aren't jutting forward. So now I'm not injuring my knees. So you sit back like you're sitting in the chair, push through the ground, stand back up. Head and shoulders stay up. It's not none of this looking at the floor. Head and shoulders stay up. Certain exercises help you do that. You got to be able to flex your ankles, your knees, your hips, they're all going to be able to move. So you work on certain exercises to help you do that, to help you get those joints to move appropriately so you can do a proper sit down squat where you got a 90 degree bend in your knee. That's what we're looking for. Okay, may as well do a walking lunge too. Walking lunge is basically <laughs> a step forward, knee comes down, 90 degree bend, come up, other foot forward. You're lunging forward. You can do lunges in place, but when you do a walking lunge and I've been down, now I've got to push off that back foot to bring this foot up. So now you're so using... So you actually should be moving. You're moving. Walking okay. lunge is moving. You go in a straight line, turn around, come back, straight line. You could do it in a room, back and forth, around the corners. Okay, Basic it. So Simple description of what a walking lunge is. These are all things part of your fitness program that you can work on with whoever it is you're working is coaching you. So the next part is cardiorespiratory conditioning, heart and lungs, getting them to work good, right? So that's our problem. What else do you need to do and who can help you? We talked about this when we did the first part of the fitness program. When we talked about your fitness first workout and plan, and then there was, who are you gonna use? Are you gonna use a coach, trainer, gym teacher, friend that's good at fitness, is the best fittest person you know, those are all people who can help you. So that's what you need to find out who to, who to help you. So in cardiorespiratory conditioning, there is, anybody know what those mean? Wow. Lit, mit, and hit. Light intensity. Light, low intensity low interval intensity. training, moderate intensity interval training, high intensity interval training. 
Which one do you think is the best for us to live longer? L. High intensity. <laughs> but you can't do high till you can do medium and low, right? So you got to start on low. What is low intensity interval training? Slow, sustained session one time. Walk around the track. Low intensity workout session. For some people, that's all they can do right now. So that's where you start, low intensity. You will burn the highest amount of fat per calories being burned in that range. Now, what is that? 60% of your maximal heart rate. And we talked about, what is that? You know, is it when your heart explodes? No, that's the high end. There's a lot of different ways to calculate this. The simple is two, the number 220 minus your age, you get a number, times 60%, 0.6 and you get a number. That's the minimum for, for a normally healthy person. If you're on medications that adjust your heart rate, there's a difference that then you have to talk to a doctor, talk to an exercise physiologist, to see what your normal 60% range would be if you're on medications. A lot of people are. So that's just one session, one time. Just go like my walking program, walk 10 minutes, turn around, walk back. That's 20 minutes, that's a good walk. 25 minutes, you know, taking 12 minutes and back, 13 minutes and back. It's all part of the walking program that's in the course that we talked about earlier. So that is a low intensity interval training. Works the heart lungs. Who, who gets tired when they get up and they have to walk to the basement and back? A lot of people. <laughs> walk to the kitchen and back, walk to the restroom and back. You get out of wind because your cardiorespiratory capacity has diminished for whatever reason. Could be age, could be illness, could be you're having a bad day and you just can't, you don't have the energy to go. So all those things affect your cardiovascular capacity. That's low interval. And that's for some people where they need to be. That's just a walking program. Moderate intensity interval training, shorter duration intervals, three to five at a time. So what could that be? Moderate intensity, I mean, now you're walking at a fast clip. You're not just walking at a slow, easy jaunt. You're walking at a fast clip for say maybe 10 minutes, then you're stopping resting. That's your interval. Then you rest for a couple minutes, you go another 10 minutes, and you rest for five minutes. You go in it, so do that three to five times. That's gonna be a moderate intensity, and you can do that on any type of machine. Treadmill, a bicycle, standing bicycle in a pool, just walking in the pool is very, very efficient cardiovascular work in, in a water aerobics class. So those are shorter durations, three to five times, at 70% of your maximal heart rate. High intensity, maximal effort intervals, five to 10 of them in a row, at 70% plus of your maximal heart rate. Again, that can be calculated for everybody based on the norms and then based on what your actual adjustment needs to be based on your health. It's not the same. I can't, I can't just hand out this high intensity program to everybody do this because it's not going to be appropriate for everybody. Some people it would be, some people it's not going to be enough. So if you look at this next graph based on that, here is a typical exercise intensity graph. 50% of your maximal heart rate, moderate activity, like warm up. You're just warming up. You're just getting up and walking to the gym, getting in and out of your car, going to the gym, going to the park. That's warming yourself up. You get up to 60%. So look, if you're 60 years old or 65 years old, that's 93 for heart rate at 60%. Whereas opposed if they're only 20, that's 120 beats per minute. So that's basically Weight control, fat burn is your low intensity interval training. That's where you're gonna burn the most fat per buck. You're not gonna burn the most fat off in the same time period. Because if I do high intensity for 10 minutes, I'm gonna burn off more calories than you can walk for 30 minutes. Because you're working harder, faster. So that's where the intervals come into effect. And it is the key. It is the most important, true fact, determined way to improve your cardiovascular health. Bless you is to do high interval, interval interval training. And that's not for everybody. So you have to work on that. 70% cardio aerobic 
hardcore training. Like I said, 70% and up. I can get up there 90 to 100% of my maximal heart rate. Not very long. So the higher you go, that interval is shorter. So instead of 10 minutes, it's maybe two minutes. Really fast, as hard as I can run. Hard as I can run on a treadmill. Swimming as fast as I can. One like to the, the pool. And then recover. Walk yourself back to the other end of the pool. Swim the other way. So there's a lot of ways to accomplish that. But that's maximal effort. That's where you're going to get the gains in your cardiovascular condition. Your heart's going to get healthier. Your lungs are going to get cleaner and healthier. You're going to be more able to do work at a, at a higher intensity, easier. So slopping the garbage cans out on the week, whatever the day it is, becomes easier and easier because your heart and lungs are better at what they're doing. S simple to understand? Okay, on to the next. That was module number two. The next mi module is Mindset Mastery. Again, that's the most important part because attitude is everything. Your mindset, if you're not feeling it, you ain't doing it, right? You know, you get up, I'm, I'm going back to bed, I'm laying down. You're not going to do it. So it's, mindset is so important. <clears throat> Again, looking at the mindset, we started the first part. What is a healthy attitude? We talked about it. We showed you the habits, routine, and ritual worksheet, which you're going to see again coming up here. How do you keep a healthy mindset? There's work worksheets and trackers to help you keep on that upper level, keep your mind good and focused. Then we come down to where at now is who and what can spoil a positive attitude? A lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people are on the who's and what's could be anything in your life. So it's important to use these trackers and worksheets, which we'll go over, to show you that. And then how do you stay positive and healthy? How do you keep it on track? That part of that lifestyle maintenance is part of knowing what triggers you so you can keep positive. So the third part, like you said, who and what can spoil a positive attitude? Break three, develop new routines and habits and create new habits and minimize your exposure to those who's, those people who just get you boiling as soon as you see them, as soon as you hear their voice, the tone of their voice. You got people like that, I got them. We all got them people. And they just boil you. So if you can, you can reduce your time and your button heads with somebody like that, you're going to be more relaxed. You have a better attitude. You're not fearing, oh, I don't want to go to that class. That person's going to be in there. That Tim's going to yell at me. He's going to be, you know. So nobody wants that. So, so creating new habits to avoid those kind of situations is what you need to get good at. This, as you're creating new habits to minimize your exposure to those who's, it's modifying poor habits to destroy your mindset and attitude. We all have some bad habits. <coughs> you know, getting, having that second cup of really thick coffee. I don't drink any of that stuff. But maybe having a half a pint of ice cream every too often. That's one of mine. You know, yeah. I love, you know. So that's a bad habit. You got to learn. What, do I, what am I learning to eat instead of ice cream all the time? What's a good option? Fruit. Too high in sugar for what I'm looking for. Yogurt. Yogurt. And, and actually low sugar pudding is actually a better treat for me than eating ice cream all the time. Low, low sugar pudding is lower calories than ice cream, even a low fat ice cream. You ever heard of the Halo brand of ice cream? That's a low sugar, better choice of ice cream. But as you get into knowing what really good ice cream is, and you go down to that red, you know there's a point where you're not going low, no. you know, because it doesn't taste like you, you're not getting any enjoyment right. out of it. Yeah. So you got to figure it out for yourself. Yeah? Do you make your pudding homemade? No, I, I am not that good of it. I'd like to learn how to make good pudding because I really like pudding or, or low sugar right. applesauce. Right. It's high in sugar usually, and that's what things you want to avoid, a lot of juices and that are high in sugar, but low sugar applesauce, low sugar apple butter, those kind of things can be a good little snack treat to take you out of that high end. So, Excuse me. Yeah. So when we talk about sugar, you got cane, you got um, monk fruit, you know, the alternatives to the sugar. So I use stevia. You use stevia. I use stevia. I got it in. I got it in. It's bland, leaf base extract. Yeah, and I've got a little eyedropper tube thing, and I also have in granular form, depending on what I'm making. So, uh, 
a little bit of stevia is a good sweetener. It's, it's more palatable than some of the other, you know, you don't want to take that HFC stuff, the high fructose corn syrup. Stay away yeah, from that right, stuff. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Stay away from that stuff. It'll make you blind and your hair fall out. I can't see so good, and, wow. and my hair's not so good because I had a lot of that when I was younger. So I'm just saying, don't eat that stuff. But there's a lot of better options, and, and that's learning in nutrition and, and finding out what is best for you. You get to do that. So let's modify those poor habits, and we talked about that. Uh, the tools we can use is this is the one. The first one we had, routines, habits, and rituals. This is what steers our daily activity, folks, this one sheet right here. If you master this sheet, you're going to know what the heck you do and why. Daily schedule, time you rise. How long does it take you to clean up and get your daily prep work in? Post-work hobbies and activities, time you go to bed. You track these things. You're going to find there's a simple pattern to your life, pretty regular pattern. And then from there, you can say, ah, what's not working for me? What is working for me? What can I modify? Maybe my eating habits, my types of food. I'm going to too much of that sugary stuff. So I got to be able to alter my diet to lower that. But you're going to see what you eat. Regular times you eat. Personal contact. Maybe this is where you're going to find those stressor people that are there. And they could be in your family. <laughs> Just saying. So these are things that you can use to, to help you identify what your daily routines are. Because we're so routine oriented, it's if you thought about it, what we do, who puts their left, set, left sock on first every day? Really? I want you to look, think about it next time you put your socks on. What sock do you put on first? You're all doing it the same way. Yeah. You don't even know it. You're tying your shoe the same way. Can you tie your shoes with your eyes closed? Yeah, we've been doing it a long time. Can you do it backwards? There's different ways to tie your shoe. We're so entrained in what we do. We're so habit oriented. Simple little things like that. You can, great tests, great tests. Coaching worksheet, are you, I, I put this in there effort. To, these are things you need to stop doing. You could fill out three things you need to stop doing that are part of your habits. Things you can do less of, keep doing, those are the good things. Things you can do more of, and things you need to start doing. These are all things you can put down on paper. And if you've done the, the, uh, the self-analysis as part of the foundation, we've done that little work in finding out about our health history and what, our, what, what makes us tick, you'll be able to identify these kind of things. Here's our habit tracker. We talked about creating new habits. This is a, perf a simple example of walking program with 31 days there. So if you walk that day, you check it off. You, 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 you daily journal, you write people who daily journal. If you did your daily journal, check it off. Hang this right somewhere. You're going to see it when you leave the house every day. Right on the door to my garage. Daily workout. To get my daily workout in, yep, every day. Check it off. Healthy breakfast. Maybe you didn't have any alcohol that day. And you looked after yourself. Self-care, basically. These are all things. Simple example of a health a habit tracker you can use to identify Good habits and how often you do these habits. At the end of the day, just come in, okay, did I work out today? Yeah, yeah, did I have a healthy breakfast? Check. Not, don't check. And at the end of the month, you're going to see what your patterns are. Mm. It's a simple way to identify what our good habits are. So then you can get this blank form. You can fill in anything you want. I want to tie my shoes right foot first. Yeah. Put that down, right foot, tie shoe first. Because why? It's going to make you think about it. If you make you think about it, it's going to become a better habit. You can do a simple little tweak like that and in your lifestyle and make a big difference. The fourth problem, how do we stay positive and healthy? You know, how, what is it that makes us our attitude poor besides the who's and the what's? Self-talk. Yes. <laughs> huh? Self-talk. Yeah, yeah, too much looking in the mirror and saying, I don't like that guy. You know, I need to do better. I need to do this and that, you know. There's too much of a lot of stuff, and that's one thing. Break the mirrors. Don't look in that person in the mirror. So there's a lot of ways to do that. The point is, how do we, how is you going to find out what you can do to stay positive and healthy all the time? My suggestion is follow the master plan. What is that, you say? Yeah, this is it right here. Mm -hmm. There's one for each of, the, each of the cornerstones. This is your mindset mastery. Who am I? 
What do I want? How will I accomplish it? Build a strong mindset using self-discovery. Identify three to four goals they work with over the next 12 months. Initiate and use self-monitoring. Review this every week, that's self-monitoring, to achieve, to record achievements and milestones while increasing motivation and adherence. If you pull this paper out once a week, it could be on a single sheet of paper, it's right here. That's the ritual sheet, back and forth. Look at that thing. You look at this sheet once a week. You look at that sheet once a week. You look at this sheet once a week. And you say, ha, ah, I'm on track. I'm doing good. I'm putting things in place to make me live healthier. So that's your mindset mastery plan. If you learn this, you learn what your lessons were. You've got your goals down, your dreams. In life, maybe for this next year alone, you have certain goals you want to accomplish. Put it down. So now it's in your mindset. You're looking at it every day. They always tell you about goals, you know. Write them down because then you're going to achieve them more often. That's what we're doing here. You put, write your goals down. You know, it seems like um, where when she was saying that uh, in regards to your mindset, what it is you're thinking, stinking thinking, you don't even have to look in the mirror. It, it's just, you know, maybe that's the habit that you're in, stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. When you start writing down your goals and actually looking at it, actually looking at your dreams, you're changing the trajectory of your thoughts. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I'm a paper guy. It's all great on computers, but if I'm not looking at it on paper, I, I read my magazines. I don't read them online. You know, I, I read my books in a book form. I don't read books online. I don't stick with it. I got a book in my hand. I'm going to go walk. And I'm going to read some of that book while I'm walking. So hopefully I don't trip. But I can get a walk in and read a, read a chapter book every day. And sometimes I do that. When I'm walking the dog with one hand, I'm reading a book, reading a chapter. Wow. But, but, yeah. And, and, and jump. <laughs> no, I don't do that. I, I, I don't. Multitasking is not always the best thing, but walking is a pretty simple thing in life. <laughs> so I don't fall too often. So just an example, having your goals. What are your dreams, your lifelong dreams? You know, it may be part of your goals. But, you know, if you don't see those goals all the time, you're not going to know what you're working towards. Lessons learned. What are five lessons you've learned over your life that are preventing you from keeping that healthy mindset? Going to see that tin too many times. I'm not in mad. I'm always mad. I'm not happy. List what your problems and your solutions are. Each problem has a solution. This is our solution for number three or number four is how to master your plan, which is part of this problem. How do we stay positive and healthy? We work on our master plan, we fill it out, and we record it, and we know what we're working towards. And as you get into the lifestyle program afterwards, you're going to see these solutions go 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, because there's w many ways to skin a cat. There's many ways to stay a positive attitude. So you're going to add additional tools to your arsenal to keep your, keep your mindset better. Pretty simple stuff. C consistent self-care. Lean on your personal support team all part of that master plan. That could be what you're putting on those goals, is more self-care. Taking that weekly self-care, that Sunday self-care day, when you're doing nothing for nobody but yourself, and make that a regular thing. Because we all care for too many other people and too many things are in our mind and we don't take time for ourselves. Amen. Having a self-care day is an important thing, really important to lower your stress and keep your attitude positive. So lean in on your personal support team, your workout partner, your best friend, your family that you still talk to, <laughs> the pastor down the street, <laughs> your mailman. Who, who has a relationship with their mailman? A lot of people I know do. They talk to them all the time. I used to have a great mail woman who would come in. She, I'd hear that truck come up the street, and I'd get out, and I'd walk out to the step, and I'd spend about 30 seconds every day talking to her. And she'd keep me motivated. She, she's had a way about herself. So you never know who's in your personal su support team yeah. that you would feel not so good about if you didn't have them anymore. Here's a self-care checklist we talked about. Simple things. Go for a walk. Paint your nails. Take a long bath. All these things are doing for yourself. Close your eyes and breathe deeply for a minute. Guarantee you. It becomes easier and easier and easier. And before you know it, you're falling asleep. <laughs> you're that relaxed. Because taking that self minute for yourself 
becomes really good. So these are all simple things you can do to, to again, work on your self-care. Questions? You know, save them all for the end. I know you're okay. That's all right. We're not, we're on to the next cornerstone, which is healthy nutrition. We built that back wall of the house up. We're working on the side. Healthy nutrition. Again, here's what we talked about. The first two bricks of this were food addictions, and we we helped solve that with our food journals, our habit trackers. When we habit track our meals, what do we eat mostly? What are our favorite meals? Are they good for us? Are they not so good for us? I had some wings the other day that had some Cajun so, uh, <laughs> spices on it. I love the stuff. It don't like me one bit. I got to stay away from that stuff. But every now and then, I go, just two wings, just two. Regretted it later. Yeah. Regretted it later on. So that's all part of habit tracker. Okay. The second one was weight, stability, control, and loss. You can't lose weight until you can stabilize your weight. You can't control your weight unless you stabilize your weight. So once you control it, you can lose weight or you can gain weight, whatever your goals are. So we talked about that and nutritional requirements, macros and micronutrients is the way to do that. And we'll briefly go over that again. So the third break is nutritional requirements, wants versus needs. We all want that piece of pizza or that piece of cheesecake, one of my favorites. <laughs> but we, is, is what we need? Probably not. So learning the balance of wants and needs important part of our nutritional plan. And then the fourth hat or the fourth problem is developing that nutritional plan from the start, just like you did the, the mindset plan. So we get into nutritional requirement, wants versus needs, using the nutritional professionals and tracking your micros and using macro tools. So this is what I pulled up on Google. I told you I went there and I pulled up nutritional professionals in my zip code. And I got like 200 people came up and these are just some that are here. This woman here works, lives, hires on Thumbtack, serves Twinsburg, spends in less than an hour, $1 estimated price just to talk to her. Some people, this guy's $150 estimated price. But what he's gonna do, he's gonna ask questions, he's gonna be your full nutritionist. Now, you don't need those people all the time, but it helps get you going on the right path. You know, a professional who knows the shortcuts and knows what you shouldn't be doing. And this is just a couple people I pulled up. The macro calculator, we talked about this, macrocalculator.com. You go online, and then you're going to enter in some pictures, some information, your height, your weight, your age, and... It's going to go through, and you're going to ask all these different things. There's blog posts there, and it's going to spit you out how many grams of protein you should be eating at each meal, how many grams of carbohydrates and fats based on your macro needs, your macronutrients, overall grouping of nutrients. Then your micro needs. You may need to have a little bit more of this type of fat in your diet and less soluble fats. Maybe need a little bit more seed fats, maybe you need some more nut fats in your diet. Uh, so these are all things that can be provided with a simple tool like this, macro calculator. Whew. So if you got that and you figure out what your plan is, you know you wanna get stronger, you wanna lose some weight, you know you need to eat X amount of calories of protein with every meal. Now let's develop and take that information and develop our plan. So here's your nutritional plan. Same basic outline as you saw in the other plan. It's all the same. How will I accomplish it? Here's my nutritional plan. I'm going to work on goals. Maybe it's drop X pounds. It may be totally pie in the sky fantasy. Fact of life, people. We all think we can do a lot more than we can as far as controlling our weight. What are your dreams in reference to your nutritional plan? I want to run a marathon. I talked about this in my class just before here. On the news this morning, anybody who watches NBC, that Chanel Jones just ran the New York Marathon. She trained for six months and never ran, ran a marathon. I've never run a marathon. I'm not going to run a marathon. The most I've ever ran in my life is 10 miles straight. And that was when I was in high school, <laughs> when my knees were good. And I wanted to just see if I could run 10 miles. So I ran 10 miles around the track. A lot of laps, 40 laps around the track ran it okay um but i'm gonna run a mile a day for 26 days i'm gonna get my marathon in in a month's time i know that's right 
So I'm working towards that. That's what I'm doing. I can do a mile. I can do four laps. But that third and fourth and fifth and sixth day, it's going to start to get hard. It's going to get really hard when you're in your second week and your third week, just like when you run a marathon, you hit that wall. you got to train for that. I'm not going to just start tomorrow. i got to train and get myself ready for that. But that's one of the goals I just put on my list for 2024 is to run one mile a day for 26 straight days and live to tell about it. <laughs> so that you have your nutritional plan, writing your lessons learned in life about your nutrition. Got to stay away from those wings with that Cajun sauces on there. That's on mine because it really affects me. So I can't do that. What are our nutritional problems? Maybe I need to learn how to make pudding, healthy pudding. So they, hey, okay, how am I going to do that solution? I'm going to hire you to show me how to make pudding. <laughs> It could be an option for people, you know, finding a nutritional right. professional to show you how to do it, get a good recipe, try it out. Good solutions for a lot of problems. So getting this nutritional plan and using it and reviewing, okay, I got my fitness plan, I got my mindset plan, I got my nutrition plan, then we're gonna get to the stress plan. You look at these four simple pieces of paper, once a month takes you five minutes to go through all four of those pieces of paper when you're waiting at the traffic light or you're at the store in line and you can renew yourself. So the fourth break solution in nutrition is now we know what we should be eating. How do we go about doing that? We talked about this briefly in the first part, but I, I, let, I saved it for the end and we're reviewing it. Reading labels, developing a menu, learning how to shop and meal preparation. That's it, that's the, uh, with nutrition. So how do you do that? You use some tools, right? You learn how to read a nutritional label. Who really, really understands these things? This is a standard label in the United States. It has to be used by every, pl every place, any manufacturers that sells food. Some will be thick, bigger and longer than others. Others could be just a few new things. But there's certain things that you wanna learn how to do. Like here's your counting calories. A fat gram is nine calories, carbohydrate is four, and a protein four. So you want to eat more carbohydrates that are good and healthy for you and more protein and stay away from the nine grams of fat because that's the butter you put on the popcorn, right? That's the thing that makes it taste the best. That's wrong. That's, I know. <laughs> Do you try to stay um, when you are look, reading a label? I have some friends that are like, if it's over five grams, I'm not eating it. That is a good rule for a lot of people. It depends on how hard it is for you to maintain your weight. If you're easily, I can control my weight pretty good because I'm exercising a lot, teaching all these dang fitness classes all the time. So I, I, I can't, I, uh, one of the things I've told people is you can't out exercise your fork as a rule. You can't eat piece of chocolate pie and think I'll get rid of it in 10 minutes. Not so fast. It takes a long time to burn a calorie off. So you gotta be careful what you eat. There is a return on your investment and <laughs> you can't just out exercise your fork. Uh, certain things I found in my diet that taste good, that aren't good for me, like the, the certain seasonings, I try to stay away from them. Uh, certain things I really like, my body manages it well, I eat more of those things. Eat a lot of oatmeal in the winter time when it's cold. A lot of stews and stuff like that that I can make in big batches with a meal program. So there's a lot of ways that you can work with your, but learning how to read a label is so important and understanding so you can look, bah, 350 milligrams of potassium, that's good. We want that. 17 grams of sugar is not so much. Only five grams of protein. So that's not a very healthy, 25% of calories are from fat. And not a great label. But as a rule, you only need to look at one thing and one thing only. Good rule of thumb is to only consume packaged with five or less ingredients. The most, the fewer ingredients, the healthier it is for you. So if you got, you go down here to the ingredients and this thing's going down, 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 down. <laughs> Put it back on the shelf. Put it back on the shelf. So reading and label is important skill to have, and you got to learn what these skills are. Why does this thing keep popping up? I'm connected to an unsafe Wi-Fi. Uh oh. Um, so that's reading and label. Food log. We talked about this. Get yourself a food log. 
What do you have for breakfast? You don't have to do this every day, but every now and then, go through a week and say a day, say, okay, I'm gonna write down what I eat. I had six ounces of frosted flakes, all right? You can look at the box. It'll tell you how many calories, how many proteins, carbs, and fat. Do that for breakfast. Add your milk if you put a milk on it. If you're not a water person, I'm not a water person. And my cereal. Some people can. I can't. Um, kefir or something else. Maybe some almond milk. Whatever you like. Lunch, dinner, and snacks. Total that up at the end of the day. See how it fits with your macro requirements to maintain stability. Because if you see you do this and you're still eating 150, 200 calories a meal more than you should, that's 450 calories a day, you're not going to get your results you're looking for to get until you get a man. And you can't manage it until you know what it is you're eating and where the holes are in your diet. So a food log such as this is a great way to track it. So then you track, ah, I'm not just going to the grocery store with my taste buds. I'm going with the shopping list. I know what I want to eat, and I'm only buying what's on my shop. I use this exact form when my wife lets me do the shopping. <laughs> and so, okay, this is what I'm going to get. These are critical things I need to have, maybe something I'm short on. You got produce, you got breads, breakfast, all these things. You just go by, okay, I need this, I need this, I need that. And it helps you to know what your menu is, to know what you need to shop. So if you get your menu for the week planned out in advance, then you know what to shop for. Ah, you're staying, you're not getting it. Okay, I'm going to Chipotle for that 1,300 calorie burrito that's not in my plan, right? I, I understand. I, I started using this. I used it the last two months when I was camping. I love this service. Freezer meals. It's just a site that I purchased and belong to where it gives you res recipes and lists of all ingredients so that you can prepare freezer meals. See, what's a freezer meal? It's a meal you put in the freezer, folks, and it's not even cooked. So I take, like I have this chicken dumpling one and I like. There's chicken, I cut up, I buy bulk chicken, cut the chicken up into pieces, put it in the bag. Cut the vegetables up, put them all in the bag. Put everything in the bag, seasonings, just what it tells you, seal it up, put it in the freezer. Some time to cook that, I take that freezer bag out of my refrigerator. Uh, I open it up and I stick it in my crock pot or in my Instapot. And okay, it says to add six ounces of broth. Add my six ounces of broth, poke it up. I've already done the prep. I'm just letting it cook while I'm out doing something. Twenty, you know, two hours later, it's cooked, and it's a healthier option. So this is something I started to use, uh, rather than. And I also use the the prep where on a Sunday I'll make a big batch of chili, you know, and I'll put it in the small containers because I'm about ready to make my chili for the winter because I make one big batch every winter. It's two big pots, you know, of chili, and I put it in those containers and I freeze them in the glass containers. And I send my diet, I bring one of those out, put it in a microwave, and I got chili made. All winter, I got all my chili made. Something that I do, but you can do other things like that. So it's just way to, to meal prep, to save yourself time, and to make sure that you've got more healthier options on hand. This is just one that I use, fam freezer meals. Uh, it's, it's a really good VIP, the familyfreezer.com. Familyfreezer.com. Check it out. I think I paid $69, and I got five books of recipes, lists, everything in there. And, and they put out new ones. I get an email every couple weeks. Here's a new recipe. It's in the thing. And they put it in the system. So you get access to this. I go in and I, I, could, I could tweak it. I could put it out. Okay, I'm going to cook for four people. It'll tweak the shopping list for you. It'll tell you how, based on how many people you're cooking for. So it's a good, it's, it's a nice little service. I like it. So now we got three of those modules done. We've got one more to do. Stress management. The most deadly of all of the cornerstones. Your, if your house has a weak cornerstone on stress, it's going to tumble. It's going to tumble. It's not going to be very strong. I think fitness is important. This is just as important in a lot of people's lives. So here it is, stress management. We talked about the first two, sources of stress, who and what. We talked about that attitude. Who are those stressors? Who are the people that are causing you stress? 
And we did that by filling out that stressors worksheet. So you're bringing that tool back in to help with attitude and, and stress kind of go together. If you're under a lot of stress, your attitude's not going to be so good and vice versa. So they kind of go together, but they're important enough to keep separate. Types of stress, the good, the bad, and how you manage stress module exercises was those set of questions I gave you that gives you some uh, uh, ideas on how to manage stress in your life. So now we're in the third and the fourth brick, your stress triggers. Who are those people? Let's put their names on paper. We want to know who they are. Who are they? And then some strategies and tools to improve your chances of not making those people stress you, hit that trigger and make your stress level go through the roof. And how do we prevent unnecessary and harmful stress? That's the key, it's prevention, right? Prevention in anything. So we'll, we'll briefly go review that. But at its core, stress management, it's meant to give you some tools to identify and manage stress more efficiently with less trauma to you today and in the future. We all got stress. Everything's a stressor. It may be something that's a stressor for me, maybe not be as much for you, and vice versa. There's a lot of things that, you know, you, you got some things that you push that button and it's going, your blood pressure's going, your heart rate's going, and you, you just got to deal with it. So that's learning how stress management is to manage what's there. You're not going to get rid of it. It's not going to happen. So how do you minimize that stress? And what tools can you use to manage to minimize that stress response, which we talked about in the first part. Implementing strategies with the tools that reduce your stress response. Stressors worksheet, this is what we had. There's other questions on it. This is the first page. Again, you'll get a copy. I put the first three down there. Worrying if you're going to have enough money to pay next month's mortgage or rent. That's a stress for a lot of people. Worrying if your old clunker car is going to break down because you may not have money for repairs. That could be something you worry about all the time. I just put those in as an example. Everybody has their own stressors. But if you can identify them, write down five things. If you can eliminate five major stressors in your life, whew, your life's going to be way better. Way, just five. It's not, it doesn't take many to improve your life, make you happier. So, And each of those stressors, you can fill it out, put in what you want. You got to determine where the stressor falls on the list. You know, if you have enough money for the mortgage, eh, not much discomfort. You always find the money. You always work. You have money available. So that's not maybe a big stressor, but it could be a complete panic mode. Maybe afraid to tell your spouse or family night away that you lost your job and you can't make the mortgage payment. So that could be a high stressor. So everybody has different level of where these stresses are per that stressor. By completing worksheets like this and, and periodically looking at it, you're going to see what continues to be a stressor for you. And if you identify them, you pick them out, you're going to be able to manage them a whole lot better. Whew. Routines, habits, and rituals. Again, here it is. We bring that sheet back up. Do you find stresses in your uh, daily commute? Maybe that's a stress because you got to drive downtown in the rush hour traffic on a rainy, snowy day. And it's miserable and it takes you two and a half hours. I know. <laughs> I know. I did it for years. I, I know it's a stress. What can you do to, to, to get rid of that stress to make it not so stressful? Carpool, met somebody else driving, you can sit back and sleep. <laughs> a lot of different ways you can do it. But if you figure out what these stressors are, you can set a solution in. Again, you can, you can, you can put any category in there you know, as to what is a stressor and figure out what they are and fill in the blanks. So it's a simple, simple tool. It's all about using the tools in your toolbox. You know, you're not going to pull out that pliers when you need a hammer. You're not going to, you know, you got to know what tool to apply to the problem at hand. This is just a, a tool to help you do that. How should we manage stress? My suggestion is reframe your relationship with stress. Reframe your response to stressors and use the RAIN principle. We talked about that last time, the RAIN principle. How to prevent unnecessary stress. Let's go back to here. Let's go back here. How should you re reframe your relationship with stress? If it's a stressor, say it's 
meeting somebody in your family again. I don't know why I keep bringing that one up. Holidays. <laughs> yeah, holidays are coming. Because of you, Your other hand's good. You're good. And, um, but maybe you, you reframe that and say, okay, I get to go see somebody else not worry about that person that's also going to be there. I need to see this person or this other group of people are going to be there. So I'm happy about reframing that stress and say, I'm going to see these people. Yeah, I'm going to push them aside. But I want to see these other people. And don't go there because of one person and not enjoy their, their time. Yet. So just reframing that to yourself and say, this is what I'm looking at. Look at the positive part of any experience that's giving you stress. And you might find a way to manage it a little bit better. Again, reframe your response with the stressors. A lot of people blow big things, blow a little thing into a big thing mm -hmm. when it's not necessarily a big thing. So understanding that, yeah, in the big scheme of life, if I don't make that car payment till the day late, it's not going to kill me. I make it late. You know, it's so just reframe that relationship with that a little bit. And then, then maybe the stressor comes down. I always find a way to do it, even though I worry about it. Maybe it's a day late. Yes? Uh, that was uh, recognize the stress response. Accept it. Accept it for what it is, like a stressor. Okay. Uh, recognize, accept. Recognize, accept. I don't use it that often. But it's a, it's a principle. We, we covered it in the past one. I don't have that slide in here okay. to explain it. It was in the last, last video on stress if you watched it. It's in there. It's in there. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but it's just a principle to take a stressor and, and put the R, uh, AI in, and you can reframe that stress using these simple tools. How do we prevent us unnecessary harmful stress? Now that's it. You can prevent it. You don't have to worry about dealing with it, right? You don't have to worry about handling it if you can prevent it in the first place. So implement those strategies and controls that will reduce your stressors. <clears throat> Again, here we back to that stressors worksheet. Who are those stressors? How can we minimize it? How can we find a way to solve that problem on that stressor? It comes up all the time. It's an important worksheet. Here is the controls and solutions matrix. I just put this up as an example. Yours would be totally different. You know, di different categories of financial, late payment. Why is your payment late? Because you forgot. Maybe you don't have a payment calendar readily that you view all the time to know that you made that you missed that payment. And I use an express, express Excel spreadsheet like this. It's got every day of the month and what bills are due that day. I just pick that up once a week. Like, okay, what bills are due this week? Okay, and let's make sure I handle that. So it's a simple solution for me. Or if I don't have those auto payments set up. Because some things I don't have on auto payments because then you don't want to be stuck when you don't have the money and have that payment bounce and that's not a good thing at always too so high balance as an example you per you made a large per purchase what's your strategy get more money increase your income develop skills to find a new type of work that you can do to to help you offset when you have that large purchase maybe you had to buy a car because it clunked or died and now you got to find a way to finance that car so emotional death in the family they were age related strategy prepare wills and papers and review them for that person done for you self-produce there's tools that you can do your own wills and all that last rights and all that kind of stuff it's in a simple little packet you can have it available in a file somewhere physical stress this is a control solution you had a heart attack maybe it was caused by poor health habits so what's your strategy develop that fitness plan get fitter get eat better Reduce your stress. All this stuff is going to help that physical stressor. Medical surveillance. What is that? That's in part of the foundation of the first module in this class. When you get an annual physical, you find out what your blood work is. Know your numbers. Know your family history for any kind of serious illness. Because your genes are pretty strong indicators of what could happen to you if you don't help control those situations that will bring those genes active. Um, career, loss of job, maybe it was caused by the company downsize. How do you fix that? 
maximize your value to the company. Learn other skills within the company so that they're not going to go to, oh, that person, we can get rid of them. You know, if you're more valuable to the company, you're not going to be the first one that's going to get laid out. Simple example. That's all it is. Develop new skills, further your education, have plan B. We talked about that. Have another job. Just waiting in the ready. Something you always wanted to do. If you ever lost your job, I want to bake cakes. You know, bake cakes. You know, figure out how you can make that into a living. Again, a simple matrix to show you a different, and again, you can extend this to all different kinds of things. You could put many financial things down there as our stressors. You know, emotional, family, that person in that family, again, he's coming up. Tim's parent every time we have a get together. How can I avoid seeing Tim? You know, there's all different things you can put on these. Physical, maybe, maybe it's part of the physical is you need to lose weight right because it's going to help you do things physically if you lose a little weight we all perform better when we're lean and mean when at anything we do so again simple stressors simple solutions matrix if you have one of these things when you look at that monthly stressors that monthly time you're going through those seven pieces of paper here's my stressors matrix what do i need to work on just keeping it at the top of your mind keeping it available so that's really that is really bricks three and four of all four of the of the modules so the next part is module six lifestyle maintenance that's in two weeks this is what we do when we got all these tools in place we know what we need to do how do we make sure we keep doing it we don't disappear and move to florida because that ain't going to help you unless you got another tim down there that's going to tell you how, how to how to make that stick in your life so I'm going to show you about my lifestyle Facebook group and an Instagram group that I'm putting together where I'll put daily information out and we'll have a options for get-togethers, either Zoom. I prefer um, going to be physical meetings like this one day a month. Don't know what time or what day of the week when it would be, but it'll be a get-together where people can come in. You have a question on any topic put it to the table. Everybody can discuss it, how, what they use to help them. Just peer support, people, is what really matters. You know, you go to an exercise class, half of it is a social thing. You meet people, you exercise with people you like, people have the same, you know, concerns, same lifestyles as yours. But if you surround yourself with people like-minded, with the like-minded goals, you're going to be way better at it. You know, you're going to you're going to not run a marathon good if you're fixing flat tires in cars all the time. You know, that's like a, a funny example, but you got to learn and be around things that are going to help you run that marathon. Get those people that are going to walk with you, run with you, to keep you on track. And if you do that, folks, this here is the key to building that lifestyle that, you, that will keep you healthier. We haven't even got to the major longevity factors that are out there. There are certain things you can do that are going to guarantee you you're going to live longer. Now, is you going to live longer in a nursing home or are you going to live longer at home, out on your own, being healthy as long as possible? That is the most important part. There's a lot of things you can do to live longer, but we don't want to just live longer. We want to live healthier longer. So there's a lot of things that are out there. That there's, there's emerging technologies and science and, and tools out there to really help you live healthier longer. And that's the important part, is not just say, I know it all, I know it all. I, I've got a stack of books on my desk that I read this year and a stack that I haven't read yet this year. We're running out of months, <laughs> you know? I'm always learning. I'm all, I've told you about being a lifelong learner. You should learn about something and have something that you're driving, striving to learn all the time. It's going to keep you more motivated. And if, like me, it's all about health. That's what I like. So I'm learning about health stuff all the time. I'm reading books. I'm reading studies. i got a study in here. I just printed it out. Let me see if I can show it right here. Comparison of YMCA cycle submaximal VO2 test and a treadmill test. So what is that? That is the ultimate test for longevity and health is your cardiovascular capacity, your volume of oxygen, VO2 max. How much oxygen 
that you breathe that you're able to utilize. If you're huffing and puffing in and out real fast, you're not getting any oxygen transfer, and you can't do any work because you're always out of breath, you're not pretty, you're not very, you know, sufficient and efficient at what you do. So VO2 max, getting that high intensity interval training is the best way to get your heart-lung capacity up. It is proven to be the most, uh, single most thing you can do to extend your life, your health span, is increase your cardiovascular capacity. Um, or move to Sardinia and all those blue zone places on the earth that where all the people live to be 100 years old. Right. You know, there's a lot of things that they've transferred from those people, those five blue zones around the world that people lived 100 all the time. And how you can in, put those into your lifestyle to help you increase your, your health span. So there's a lot of stuff out there that you can do. And, uh, I was just reading this, and because I, I used to do this in the fitness when I was doing more personal training, was doing VO2 max tests, you know, putting person on a treadmill with the breathing thing on, checking their heart rate, seeing where their heart rate goes up, when it's stabilized, when it goes up. And there's a formula you can use to tell you how much oxygen you're consuming. It's an estimate. The true way is when they hook you up to oxygen, they actually measure that oxygen coming in and how much oxygen is coming out. So they know how much you utilized. So that's, and they do that under stress. You got them running on the treadmill. We're not going to do that. You're all going to tell me I'm crazy, right? But there's submaximal. You can do a little step test. We step up on a 12 inch box, you step back down, other foot up and down. Do that for three minutes. Check your pulse, check your breathing rate. You can get a decent estimation of somebody's cardiovascular rate right? by doing a simple test like that. And there's, I used to do this cyclogrammetry test where you're on a bicycle, just a spinning type bike, and doing the same thing. We increase the workload. How does your heart rate adjust? So there's way, and that's what that arc was, comparison, comparing those cycle tests to treadmill tests, and how can they be utilized more efficiently in the adult populations. And so it's just something that I, I added to this. I just read this new study on it, and they're coming out with new studies all the time. Our tax dollars at work, folks. They fund all these National yeah. Institute of Health studies and science stuff all the time. Sometimes there's good information that come out of it if you know where to look. So, so that's it. The next class is going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how, what do we do now that we have all the tools in place? How do we go forward? Regular attending, you know, there's Weight Watchers. You could go through the list of all these places that have regular meetings, and there's a reason why. It works. It works because you're keeping people fresh and new information. You're keeping them accountable. They're creating a new habit that's really good for them, so, right? So these are all reasons why those kind of things are good and valuable, and that's why I think it's invaluable. And I like to, you know, start a group here. And so I've talked to Jen about it. Where can we do to have this group here? What day of the week, what time is going to be best for most people that want to come and participate? And, and get some information. And we can use the kitchen maybe and do some nutritional stuff. There's a lot of options you can do at a place like this or other places. So we'll see what happens, but that's what I'm working on the details. And Cause I already have the Prime Fit Life Facebook group. You could go sign up and it's free. And I haven't been posting a lot of stuff to that Facebook group yet, but I will be when we're done here. I'll be, I've got a whole list of things I can post there uh, just to give you information you know, that you can utilize, so.